This week on the show, we cover Dragonfly BSD 5.6. We talk a little bit about OpenBSD Vulkan support. We also talk about bad UTMP implementations in glibc and FreeBSD, as well as covering open SSH protection against the side channel attacks, the distinction between ZFS and OpenZFS, and more in this week's episode of BSD Now. BSD Now, episode 304, Prospering with a Vulcan, recorded on the 26th of June, 2019. Hello, I'm your host, Benedict Treuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. Welcome this week. We have a great headline for the Dragonfly folks, because Dragonfly BSD 5.6 has been released. It's out, and it's flying around happily with some uh, nice big tickets items uh, listed. So we covered the previous Dragonfly BSD uh, release candidates a couple of times. So about now, this is the final release. So 5.6.0 came out on June 17th, uh, quickly followed by 5.6.1 on the 19th. The major changes are obviously to improve the virtual memory subsystem, especially on the newer AMD hardware, uh, and update the Radeon graphics drivers and improve performance of the Hammer 2 file system. And the 5.6.1 fixes a misconfiguration um, in SSHD and the possible lockup in the TTM graphics stuff. If you're looking for the details of every commit between the 5.4 and 5.6 branches, they have links there. Um, but the big things that change is they now have um, a bunch of test results on the performance differences between 5.4 and 5.6. Uh, so if you're interested in how big the improvements are, uh, then you can see those uh, in the post. But they also um, solved a bunch of other things in the VM system, including reducing stalls in the page allocation path, uh, improving the page allocation algorithm to avoid reiterating over the same queues as the search is widened. So normally when you're looking uh, for some pages that aren't in use to allocate for uh, something you're trying to do, uh, you'll search, you know, the active queue first or whatever, uh, the, whichever queue makes sense to search first. And when you don't find it, you then widen the search. But the old algorithm would end up searching all the places you just searched again and then looking wider. Uh, and so now it knows that I just searched there. Let's not look there because obviously I'm only searching all these other places because I didn't find anything in the first queue. Yeah, no time wasted. Yeah, they've added a new VM page hash set of APIs that allows the kernel to do uh, heuristical lockless lookups of VM pages uh, using hash tables. Change the VM hold and unhold semantics to not require any spin locks so that you just don't spend a bunch of uh, CPU time waiting for things to happen and change the VM page wake up uh, to also not require any spin locks and changed the wiring of a VM page to no longer manipulate the queue the page is on, which uh, saves a lot of overhead since you don't have to lock the queue to modify the page. Uh, instead, the page will be removed from the queue only if the page out daemon actually uh, encounters the wired page. This allows pages to enter and leave the buffer cache quickly uh, without uh, all the extra overhead. Uh, they also refactored the handling of any fictitious pages. Um, and they also removed um, the PV list um, element of the struct entirely. VM pages in mappings no longer allocate the PV entries, uh, saving an enormous amount of memory when multiple processors utilize a large shared memory map, such as, uh, say, a Postgres database cache. And they've also refactored the VM object shadowing, disconnecting the backing linkages from the VM object itself, and instead organizing all the linkages in a new structure called a VM map backing, which uh, is connected to the VM map entry itself. And PMAP operations now iterate over that VM map backing structure rather than spin locked page list. Uh, and the, the flow test and match operations against the page table entries found in the PMAP at the request uh, requisite location. Um, this doubles the VM fault performance on shared pages and reduces the locking overhead for both faults and PMAP operations. So in general, uh, a bunch of improvements to handle how the operating system manages memory, uh, especially now that you have multiple separate um, 
memory controllers that you need to coordinate with. Hmm. And it should have impact, uh, as mentioned, on uh, databases like Postgres. Yep. Uh, then in, on the DRM front, they updated the uh, drivers. So they have major updates to the Radeon and TTM, uh, which is some AMD support code. Um, not quite gotten the AMD support up to the more modern uh, cards or what the Ryzen APUs use yet, uh, but work in progress. Uh, much improved UEFI frame buffer support. Uh, fixed a major deadlock uh, that was causing hangs in the TTM code, uh, refactored the startup delay uh, to avoid conflicts between the i915 driver and X startup, and added a new get PCI info um, call to improve the Mesa and libdrm support, and fixed excessive wire memory uh, buildups so that the graphics driver isn't going to keep taking up all your memory, and they fixed the Linux slash Dragonfly page mask confusion in the DRM code. I guess um, Linux and Dragonfly both have uh, um, a macro called page mask that isn't exactly the same between them, and it was causing some problems. Uh, and they also fixed a bunch of other APIs. Uh, it doesn't say what version of Linux their DRM code is based on. Uh, I managed to find out what OpenBSD and FreeBSD were based on to answer enough com- questions in an upcoming story, but I don't see it obviously here for Dragonfly. But they're usually not far behind. Or yeah. For a while, they were quite far ahead. They're, they're catching up. And there's also news from Hammer 2. Yeah. Um, the Hammer file system sync code has been rewritten to significantly improve performance. So when you actually ask the file system to write out any buffers that are still only in memory, the sequential write performance has been improved. They added a simple dependency tracking to prevent... Uh, directory and file splits during create, rename, remove operations uh, so that you have better consistency after a crash. Uh, so that, you know, when you delete a file, it turns out what you're actually doing is updating the directory, not the file. And so you have to make sure that uh, the directory change gets synced, even though you don't think you actually touched the directory because you only removed a file, right? Or you know, if you rename a file from one directory to another, you touch both directories and you don't actually touch the file. Hmm. Directory entries. Yeah. It's like, I executed this command, which does a syscall on this file, but I didn't touch the file. I touched these two directories that are completely different. Also attempting to pipeline the flush code against the the front end, improving flush versus front end write consistency, or concurrency, sorry, uh, and making the unmount operation better, uh, and fixed an allocator race that could lead to corruption of the file system and lots of other bugs. Okay, that seems like a decent release to put out, and mm-hmm. it's ready to take. Uh, providing everything that you need, like checksums and upgrading instructions, are in the release announcements, as well as all the nitty-gritty details of the changes between Dragonfly 5.4 and this release, which we don't get into because it's a lot. Um, yeah, so congratulations, Dragonfly, on another release. And next up, as Alan already teased a little bit, uh, we have news from OpenBSD about Vulkan support. So this is over at Pharonix. Um, This is not directly um, from OpenBSD, but it's linked uh, to commits. And it starts with, somewhat surprisingly, OpenBSD has added the Vulkan library and ICD loader support as their newest port. So this new graphics slash Vulkan dash loader port provides the generic Vulkan library and ICD support that is the common code for Vulkan implementations on the system. Uh, this doesn't enable any Vulkan hardware drivers or provide something new to not available elsewhere, but is rare seeing Vulkan work among the BSDs, or at least on, on OpenBSD. Uh, there's also in ports the related components like the SPIR-V headers and tools, GSL lang and the Vulkan tools and validation layers. So uh, they write that this is of limited usefulness, at least for the time being, considering OpenBSD, like the other BSDs, uh, lag behind the DRM kernel. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, support that is ported over from the mainline Linux kernel tree, but generally they're not years behind the kernel upstream. They're catching up. They're 
they got better in recent well, years. Well, yes, I, I have. I, I did my refutation of that point <laughs> at the end of the story. Okay, so uh, they write uh, particularly that with Vulkan, newer kernel releases are needed for some Vulkan features, of course, uh, as well as achieving decent performance. Uh, the Vulkan drivers of relevance are the open source Intel A and V Vulkan drivers and the Radeon RADV drivers, both of which are in MISA, though they haven't seen any testing results to know how well they would work, if at all, currently on OpenBSD, but they're at least in MESA and obviously open source. Yes, and so the point I made was that the BSDs are actually not that far behind anymore. Uh, FreeBSD 12 shipped with DRM code from Linux 4.16, which was released in April 2018. Yep. Um, and that was, you know, uh, what FreeBSD 12 came out uh, six plus months ago. Uh, so, you know, when it came out, that, that code was still a supported version of Linux. Um, and Actually, now, if you are slightly adventurous, the drm devel port on FreeBSD uh, lets you try a newer version of the graphics drivers, uh, and that's based on Linux 5.0 from March of 2019. And then over on OpenBSD, uh, in April of this year, they committed their update of their DRM code from 4.4 to 4.19. Uh, so both FreeBSD and OpenBSD have modern DRM graphics drivers that are probably as up-to-date, if not more up-to-date, than what ships in, say, something like Ubuntu. Yeah, and so um, they close that with basically, with Vulkan on the BSDs, there's also limited net native game slash application supporting the Vulkan API. Though possible, at least on FreeBSD, it's decent enough uh, to support for Linux binary compatibility. Uh, OpenBSD 6.5 uh, mentioned here uh, has a few years back dropped its Linux binary comp compatibility support in the name of security. Uh, so even if there happens to be Vulkan drivers working nicely on OpenBSD, there isn't much software to take advantage of them. Well, the, the Linux compatibility they're talking about there would, I guess, be commercial games and so on. Uh, but yes, um, someone in the comments notes that um, OpenBSD is already using this for the Dolphin emulator and for VK Quake. Yeah, I guess this is a, an one commit of many to follow that will uh, add more support for applications and uh, yeah yes. so this is the first one of many so contrary to what 4MX was trying to say uh, you can actually play Vulkan based games on OpenBSD now which is interesting mm -hmm. so we, we covered a couple of times OpenBSD and gaming so this is uh, just another uh, one on that pile and so yeah OpenBSD is not just in the secure server area but also in more and more gaming. Very nice. All right, it's time for the news roundup this week. Uh, we found a story about bad UTMP implementations in glibc and FreeBSD. Yeah, uh, so this uh, is a post from DavMac uh, talking about his software, DNet. And he says, I recently released another version, 0.5.0, of DNIT, my service manager slash init system. There were a number of minor improvements to the build system and so on and so on. But one of the main features was S6 compatibility uh, readiness uh, notifications and, importantly, support for updating the UTMP database. So at this point, I'd expect there might be one or two people who don't uh, know what UTMP database might be. So on Linux, if you run man UTMP, you can find out the UTMP file allows one to discover information about who is currently using the system. There may be more users currently using the system because not all programs use UTMP logging. Or if you read the much more helpful OpenBSD man page, <laughs> it uh, explains in a bit more detail and also tells you that the UTMP file is used by programs like users, w, and who uh, to actually tell you who's logged into the system. <laughs> So, in other words, the UTMP is a record of who is currently logged into the system, and there's also the WTMP file, which records every login and logout, so it lets you find out you know, when someone logged in and how long they stayed logged in, uh, whereas the UTMP file is who's currently logged in. Okay. The WTMP file also logs things like reboots and startups and so on. Oh, and apparently time zone, or like uh, when the clock is fixed. Anyway, uh, this is a hint at the main motivation of using UTMP support in DNet. I wanted the who command to correctly port who is logged in, since I'm guessing their init handles console logins. Uh, it, however, when I began to implement the support for UTMP and WTMP in DNet, I also started to think about how these databases worked. 
Uh, I know that they're simply flat file databases where each record is a fixed number of bytes and the size of the struct UTMP structure and basically just written out to disk. The files are normally readable by unprivileged users so that utilities like who or w don't actually need to be set UID or set GID root or some other user in order to be able to read the file. It's just a file that's readable by anybody. And updating and reading the database is done uh, behind the scenes via normal file system reads and writes. So you call the libc or libutil functions get ut ent or put ut line uh, or get utx ent and put utx line um, to put records into these databases. Or in OpenBSD, you call the login or logout APIs as part of libutil. So the author here wondered, if the files consist of fixed size records and are readable by regular users, how is consistency maintained? That is, how can a process ensure that when it updates the database, it doesn't conflict with another process also trying to update the database at the same time? Similarly, how can a process uh, reading an entry from the database be sure that it receives a consistent full uh, record and not a record which has been partially updated? Um, saying, you know, after all, POSIX allows that a write can return without having written all of the rested bytes. Uh, and I'm not aware of Linux or any other BSDs documenting that it cannot happen for regular files. Clearly some kind of locking is needed and a process that wants to write uh, or read from the database must lock it first, performing its operation and then unlocking the database. Um, once again, this happens under the hood in the implementation uh, in libc or libutil or whatever. Then he wondered if a user process is able to lock the UTMP file uh, could they do that such that it prevents updates that would stop a user uh, from man so what would stop a user from manually acquiring the lock on that file uh, possibly for a long time or even indefinitely sure. uh, and would that actually prevent that database from being updated so that new logins and logouts wouldn't actually be recorded yeah uh, unfortunately the answer is nothing stops that <laughs> <laughs> and yes, it is possible on different systems to prevent the database from being correctly updated, or even sometimes to prevent users from being able to log into the system. Aye. Even from single user? So on Linux, using glibc, uh, and possibly other systems also using glibc and so on, updates to the database uh, uh, can be com prevented completely, and logins can be delayed by up to 10 seconds uh, while they wait and eventually give up on the lock. On FreeBSD, updates to the database can be prevented and logins uh, can be blocked indefinitely. Um, so they filed a bug report for that. Um, and so note that on FreeBSD, the file is actually called utx.active, uh, but is otherwise the same as UTMP. Um, basically, when we switch to the extended model, when uh, Edge Houghton rewrote it, um, the file name changed to be compatible. Anyway, a patch was quickly put together after uh, the bug was filed, uh, and it's gone back and forth a little bit, trying to find the right uh, changes to make to, to get this sorted out. Um, they also found problems elsewhere. If uh, you're using Linux with the Musil libc, it doesn't actually implement those UTMP functions. It has no up stubs. Um, so it doesn't actually populate that UTMP file. And so blocking it doesn't do anything. Uh, but it was never going to log anything anyway, so there's that. And then OpenBSD structures its UTMP file, so there's one particular offset in the file for each TTY device. Um, and so it avoids the need for locking since, you know, only TTY7 is going to update the offset for TTY7, um, uh, and it's not going to be doing, you know, somebody logging in and a different person logging out at the exact same time. It's basically re-serialized by the different TTY. So it performs no locking for reading, which leaves open the possibility of possibly reading a partially written entry or something like that. Uh, it says, well, this whole thing isn't an issue for single-user systems, but for multi-user systems, it could be a concern. In such systems, they recommend making the UTMP or WTMP files readable only by the owner or group or removing them altogether and foregoing the ability for unprivileged users to run the who command. Otherwise, the user might be able to lock the file and cause problems. Hmm. As for a fix that it would allow unprivileged users to still read the database, uh, they've looked at a couple different things, um, but it might make sense to just uh, basically allow the kernel side to override the lock uh, if it's held by a user or something. Because 
switching to a more complicated database of some kind or having a daemon to serialize stuff just seems like a lot of work for this basic functionality. Yeah. I looked at the FreeBSD uh, bug report for it and um, definitely a, a good find for a bug in this case. And thank you for reporting it. Um, one thing um, Konstantin Belisov uh, noted was that on FreeBSD, and I think many other operating systems, uh, even though the write syscall is asynchronous, so like you write a bunch of data, if you don't enable uh, synchronous mode, then the write will return as soon as you copy all the data into the kernel. But you know that data is not necessarily written to disk yet, right? That's that's normal. Um, but once that happens, even if the data has not been written to the disk yet, if some other process tries to read to read data uh, from that file they will see the copy that's in the buffer cache still. Uh, so basically, they'll see the write that you finished, um, even if it hasn't actually been written out to the disk yet. So as long as the write contains the entire uh, record, then when you do a read, you will either see before that write happened or after that write happened. You will never get uh, a shorn write, basically. You'll never see a version that's just the middle. Now, if the power goes out, and only part of that write is actually been written to disk, then you can end up with a shorn write and get a corrupt record like that. Uh, but in a running system, um, the on FreeBSD anyway, that's the only one I saw the comment for, um, if you've written the data to the file, uh, even if it's not flushed to disk, when you read, you will either see all of it or none of it, not a partial one. Now, if you're writing a lot of data and you do it as multiple separate write calls of chunks, then you could have that. But as long as you, you know, write the whole chunk at once, then it will either be all or nothing. It will be atomic. But yes, um, it'd be good to get um, this fixed up in FreeBSD. There's one or two different patches in there and a couple of ideas of other ways to do it as well. Hopefully we can get somebody to be able to spend a couple minutes sorting that out. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next story has uh, OpenSSH gets an update to protect against side channel attacks. So this is in the uh, recent OpenBSD release, and they covered that on securityboulevard.com. Uh, they write that last week, Damien Miller, a Google research uh, or a security researcher, and one of the more popular OpenSSH and OpenBSD developers announced an update to the existing OpenSSH code that can help protect against the side channel attacks that leak sensitive data from computers' memory. This protection, Miller says, will protect the private keys residing in the RAM against Spectre, Meltdown, Rowhammer, and the latest RAM bleed attacks. So the SSH private key can be used by malicious uh, threat actors to connect to remote servers without the need of a password. Uh, according to CSO, the approach used by, Open B, uh, by OpenSSH could be copied by other software projects to protect their own keys and secrets in memory. However, if the attacker is successful in extracting the data from a computer or server's uh, random access memory, they will only obtain an encrypted version of an SSH private key rather than the clear text version. So they can't do much with it. Uh, in an email to OpenBSD, Miller writes that this change encrypts private keys when they are not in use with a symmetric key that is derived from a relatively large pre-key consisting of random data, currently 16 kilobytes. And then he further adds that, quote, attackers must recover the entire pre-key with high accuracy before they can attempt to decrypt the shielded private key, but the current generation of attacks have bit error rates that, when applied cumulatively to the entire pre-key, makes this unlikely, unquote. So implementation-wise, the keys are encrypted shielded when loaded and the automatically and transparently unshielded when used for signatures or when being saved or serialized, uh, Miller said. And the OpenBSD developer hope that they will be able to uh, remove the special protection against side channel attacks in a few years' time when computer architecture has become less unsafe. Uh, Miller said at the end of the patch, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, um, I don't know. It seems reasonable enough to, it might be worth the complexity to just keep it. Could be, yeah. So edit security is never uh, never worse to uh, keep around. Yeah, you know, um, we've kind of for a long time wanted to not have those keys just sitting around open in memory. Yeah. But you know, previously, if the attack was somebody has access to all the memory of your computer, hmm. then encrypting it didn't really help. Game you'd over. have to have the decryption key somewhere else in memory. Uh, so you've only maybe made it a little bit more difficult. But now, because that the decryption key for your actual private key 
is 16 kilobytes, when doing the side channel attacks to leak a little bit of data at a time, uh, it would take them, you know, too long to try to actually recover all 16 kilobytes of the pre-key to be able to decrypt uh, your private key. Yep. And that's why you should uh, always keep the latest OpenSSH version around on server and the client. So you have the latest protections that OpenBSD built in for you. Very nice. Uh, next up, we have ZFS versus OpenZFS on the IX Systems block. You've probably heard us use a mix of the terms ZFS and OpenZFS, and an exploration uh, of that is now long overdue. So, you know, in general, they mean the same thing, right? Uh, you know, even on the FreeNAS blog here, they refer to ZFS and OpenZFS seemingly at random uh, when talking about this amazing file system that is at the heart of FreeNAS and, and many other FreeBSD systems and so on. Um, so since its inception, ZFS, which referred to the Zettabyte file system, um, developed originally at Sun Microsystems under the CDDL, well, and then published under the CDDL license back in 2005 uh, and was part of the OpenSolaris operating system. Uh, and it was uh, revolutionary for being uh, completely decoupling the file system from specialized storage hardware and even specific computer platforms. You know, the fact that uh, ZFS is bi-endian, meaning you can create the file system on your x86 computer and still read it on an ARM computer. For example, with UFS on FreeBSD, you can create a, a, a UFS file system on ARM and read it on ARM, and you can do the same on x86. But if you create on a little endian system, you can't read it on a big endian system and vice versa, whereas ZFS can actually you can literally move the disk back and forth between the two types of machines and it will just keep working. It does the right thing. Yeah. And, you know, the ZFS uh, developers did that originally because Solar uh, Sun had to run on Spark and x86 and they were opposite endianesses. Uh, so the portable nature uh, and advanced features led ZFS to be ported to FreeBSD and Linux and Apple and so on, even Windows now. Uh, and so back in 2008, FreeBSD shipped with ZFS as part of FreeBSD 7. But eventually, uh, Oracle bought Sun and ruined everything. Um, and then Oracle ceased public development of ZFS and OpenSolaris, instead continuing with closed source development only. Um, disappointed but undeterred, a group of OpenSolaris users and developers forked the last version of OpenSolaris and created the Illumos project. Uh, and that is basically what FreeBSD continued to use as its upstream for uh, ZFS. But as more and more different uh, platforms started using ZFS, uh, and after a number of successful ZFS Day events, um, the co-founder and creator of ZFS, Matt Ahrens, created the Open ZFS Project, uh, which basically remain an umbrella organization to bring all of the different people working on ZFS together and have things like the Open ZFS Developer Summit and ideally one day a common repo with all the code that is the same across all the different versions of ZFS or all the different platforms that use ZFS. Mm -hmm. uh, so this also involved creating the Open ZFS repo, which at the time was just a copy of the Illumos repo, which is a place where we could coordinate development around. Yeah, that's quite some history. Yeah. Uh, Matt also noted at a recent developer summit uh, that more than 50% of the original OpenSolaris ZFS code has actually been replaced with newer code in OpenZFS as uh, we've continued to add new features and functionality. So ZFS generally refers to file system, but every once in a while it can actually mean uh, the Oracle version as well and some of the other bits, whereas OpenZFS is specifically referring to the the open source one. So we try to talk about Oracle ZFS and Open ZFS, and then there's just ZFS, which is everything. Yeah, mostly when open source people mention ZFS, they mean the Open ZFS version. They just abbreviate it a little bit. Almost everybody. The the Oracle one is not very popular. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, but there's a small update for this summer. Uh, as readers have pointed out, the role of ZFS on Linux, aka ZOL, has become a bit of a hot topic, and OpenZFS has experienced rapid growth uh, and development on Illumos, FreeBSD, and Linux in recent years, and has led to some uh, features you know, arriving out of order and in different ways. For example, the native encryption feature landed in Linux uh, 
well, it's been in the development branch for a while, but it was uh, released recently, and uh, I landed in Illumos yesterday, oh. actually. Uh, so the encrypted file system support, and it's available in the module uh, from ports if you want to use the development version on FreeBSD as well. Yes. Uh, but it requires um, 12 stable or 13 because of the new encryption algorithm. So hopefully when 12.1 comes out, things will get a little mm -hmm. easier there. That's exciting news. So recognizing that, you know, having the big differences between the different ZFS platforms, uh, you know, the original idea of the OpenZFS umbrella project was to try to keep the differences between, you know, when we talk about OpenZFS, that we, if it works in one, it works on them all kind of thing, right? Whereas currently, um, there are features that exist in each different platform that only exist in that platform. You know, for a long time, Trim was only available on FreeBSD, and uh, the encryption was only available on Linux and so on. And now we're trying to get that back so that everybody has all of the features. And so that it's easier to move uh, pools between different uh, operating systems. Uh, and so as part of that, uh, we're rebasing uh, into one common repo. Uh, so in a in the next few months, as we finish the last bits of work on this, um, the version of you know ZFS on FreeBSD, I guess, uh, actually, yeah, in the ports tree on FreeBSD now, there's actually a port called OpenZFS. And if you install that, it's a newer version of ZFS uh, that works on FreeBSD. Uh, and when those diffs uh, get merged upstream, uh, then that new repo will become the official OpenZFS repo. Mm -hmm. And it will work on both Linux and FreeBSD, uh, and the Lumos will continue to pull individual changes into their repo. Uh, but the idea is that over time, the OS X and Windows ports will also join into this repo, and eventually all of the uh, um, different platforms that use it will be there. So we're hoping uh, that this transition path will be something that the uh, NetBSD and other uh, downstream consumers of ZFS will be able to follow as well. Yes, and uh, ultimately this will be uh, good for everyone because everyone pulls from the same source and then coordination happens between everyone and everyone knows what next features are being developed. Yeah, uh, and it's not exactly clear how we're going to do it yet, but it seems like we might also end up with, um, you know, when FreeBSD 12.1 ships, it will ship with, you know, uh, the same ZFS says is in 12.0, but with a couple of patches we have for performance improvements and fixes and so on. Uh, so it'll be just like it would have been before. But you can also go and install the open ZFS package from ports onto your system uh, and actually have access to the newer ZFS features, which in the long term could mean that um, over time you'll actually be able to update the version of ZFS you're using without having to change the version of your operating system. Mm -hmm. Which means for more features that are coming in rapidly rather than just waiting for the next OS release. Yeah. You know, I know for a while when I was like, oh, it's going to take forever before they, I have a, a deployment of 100 machines and they're running, you know, a mix of, you know, 11.2 and 12.0 and so on. And, oh, uh, well, back in the time when it was a mix of like 9.0, three and ten dot two or whatever, uh it was a matter of, oh, there's the new uh ZFS for Zoom for um replication or the transparent compression, uh, so that when you do a ZFS send, it keeps the files compressed instead of uncompressing them. But not every one of my machines supported that. Whereas if I could update ZFS on all of them with just a package, that might have made it easier. Mm -hmm. But we want to somehow manage that in such a way that it doesn't lose out on the extra integrations that FreeBSD has coming from the fact that ZFS is built into the operating system isn't only a third-party package, uh, like the bootloader having support for it and so on. Uh, and so we're still figuring out the best ways to manage that, but the idea is that uh, you'll be able to kind of have the best of both worlds. Uh, all the integration of having it built in, but with the optional ability to get to a newer version without having to update your OS. Oh yes, so that's exciting, and we'll definitely keep you updated when that happens. Yeah, um, but we're basically expecting as soon as we can get um, all of the CI hooked up to test it, and then if integrating FreeBSD still passes all the tests, then it will become part of the repo. 
Mhm. Okay, now it's time for the Beastie Bits this week. Uh, the first item that we found is how to safely and portably close a file descriptor in a multi-threaded process without running into problems with e ENTR by Colin Percival, a tweet. Yes, he says, it only took me seven and a half years after originally writing this blog post back in 2011 uh, to find the answer. So he says, <laughs> POSIX close is broken. <laughs> in the world of POSIX, everything is a file. Well, sort of. There's sockets and pipes, and which behave rather like files, except that, that you can't seek on them, and they become and they come with some extra metadata and so on. And then there's devices, and sometimes you can only read or write to appropriately sized blocks and not individual bytes, and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, but in all these cases, you've got a file descriptor, and when you're finished, uh, you release the resources by calling the close system call. There's just one small problem: the way POSIX has defined close is completely and utterly broken. A few days ago, uh, Taylor R. Campbell, the same guy who reported uh, Tarsnap's incredibly stupid crypto bug back in January of 2011, sent me an email pointing out some peculiar language in the standard. If close is interrupted by a signal that is to be caught, it shall return negative one and set error node to e enter, meaning interrupted. Mm. Uh, now, we're used to dealing with e enter. Almost every system call we make can be interrupted and return e enter. No problem. We just reissue the system call, uh, keeping, uh, keep trying until we get through without uh, a signal interrupting us. That would be fine, except for these last two words. And the state of the file descriptor is unspecified. So if the close call gets interrupted, it's not clear whether the file is still open or if it's closed. Oh. Hmm. So if close returns interrupted and you call it again, you might get e bad f. Uh, this is not a file descriptor because the file was already closed. Even worse, if you're running in a threaded process, a different thread might have opened a file uh, and been assigned that same file descriptor value. Right? So you open file one, open file two, open file three. You try to close file three and it gets interrupted. If you try again, you might get an error saying that's not a bad file descriptor because it was closed. When you say might? <laughs> right. Um, so if you called close and it got interrupted, but it didn't close the file yet, then you do want to run close again to close it sure. properly. Mm -hmm. But if it did close the file and it got interrupted, and by the time you get around to it and you're about to try close three again, but some other thread has opened another file. You're closing that once? And it's it's opened that as file descriptor three. So if you close it, you've just closed somebody else's file. Whoops, that's not intentional. Uh, and, and that thread <laughs> is going to be very confused how the file it opened was randomly just closed. Huh, some leftover from previous work. Yes, so uh, if you're running in a threaded process, a, a different thread might have opened a file and been assigned that same file descriptor value, at which point your second close call uh, will succeed at closing the wrong file. Throw in another file being opened and you've got silent data corruption. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, if close returns the interrupted and you don't call it again, you might have this open descriptor or socket and have it just laying around in your process. For a short-lived process, that might not matter. But if it's a server that's going to run for weeks or years, then you know you could build up a lot of those that way. So then the blog post goes on with a couple of different ways he tried to do it. But that's, you know, they're not always great. It looks like the one it looks like he tries to block signals while he calls close so that it doesn't get interrupted. Uh, and a couple other things. Um, but then back to the original Twitter thread here, uh, he found that if you create a socket pair and write a random cookie uh, to that socket pair, when you want to close a file descriptor, you... Uh, do a mutually exclusive lock, duplicate the uh, second file descriptor you created, and keep trying that until it succeeds or fails with some error that's not uh, interrupted. Then you can close the, that file descriptor. Um, if we got e interrupted there, then we will actually try to receive the message on that file descriptor. Um, and if it was the random cookie we expected, then we can close it. And if it's not, then we know that it's some other file descriptor and we shouldn't touch it. So he says, the first trick here is that unlike close, 
Uh, Duke 2 has a well-defined semantic in POSIX with respect to E interrupted. It's atomic, so there's no way for another thread to accidentally reuse that same descriptor uh, between the implied close and the reopen. The second trick here is that while we can use Duke 2 to guarantee that the original descriptor was safely closed, we now need to close that duplicate. But we can distinguish between E interrupted and closed and E interrupted and still open by using the message peak receive call to look for that magic cookie to know that this is our file descriptor, not some other file descriptor. If you're on a perverse OS where close can successfully close the file descriptor and still return uh, E interrupted, and another thread wins a race and reuses that descriptor, there's still no way uh, you'll actually see our random cookie. Uh, so we won't make the mistake and try to close that raced file descriptor. He also goes on, I'm not sure that I recommend this approach to anyone, but it's nice to know that closing a file descriptor in a multi-thread process safely is actually possible. Yeah. <laughs> then Taylor Campbell, who the person that reported the, these two bugs that uh, inspired the blog post back in 2011, uh, earlier this week pointed out that, has anyone ever found evidence that close can actually fail to close the file descriptor uh, even when it returns an error? He says, when I surveyed the BSDs in Linux back in 2011, the answer was no. Close on a file descriptor would always close the file descriptor, uh, or sorry, close the file and descriptor if it exists, even uh, if an error like E interrupted or E no space. And Colin points out, turns out, yes, uh, HPUX is documented as having the file descriptor open if close returns uh E interrupted. I'll concede that this is an obscure case, but it's proof of the existence of it nonetheless. Mm -hmm. uh, more relevantly, my policy is to code to the standard, not to rely on what seems to work. And then uh, PHK points out, so how do you test your code? <laughs> yeah, so these are the little intricacies of uh, the file descriptor on multi-threaded processes. Yes, well, why multi-threaded programming is hard. I keep hearing that, yeah. <laughs> um, so a couple uh, meetup reminders. The Noxbug uh, meetup is actually June 27th. That's tomorrow. So if you're listening to this, uh, it's probably mm. very soon. Um, like this will probably come out on Thursday. So yeah, you'll have a couple <laughs> of hours of notice, but sorry. Anyway, um, there's BSD and Barbecue at uh, the Knoxville, Tennessee BSD User Group, which is uh, at 222 Keller Lane in Marysville, Tennessee. Uh, they say that the, this month they have no scheduled talks. It's just be a social gathering with barbecue. Uh, and it seems like that's great. And they say that the meeting will be held at IX Systems' office. Parking will be available at the parking garage across the street or on the street around the side of the building. Okay. Uh, separately, there's also the... Uh, Portland BSD Pizza Night, uh, which will also be on June 27th, but at 7 p.m., they'll be meeting up at the Flying Pie Pizzeria, uh, 3 Monroe Park Parkway in Lake Oswego. Yeah. So if you just want to hang out for barbecue, you have to go to Knoxville, and if you want pizza, you have to go to Portland. <laughs> There's your choice, yeah. But be soon. You By the time you hear this, it might already be uh, over or has started. Yes, but both of these are monthly things so if you miss this one you can always catch the next one. Oh yes of course yeah that's a good thing of these uh, beast user groups happening uh, frequently uh, next we found a difference between dollar x and dollar curly brackets x so if you've ever seen that different syntax especially in something like a shell script where you can have dollar x or dollar open curly brace, x close curly brace, uh, we have some examples. So here, when you assign a variable, you just do x equals 11, or 10. Uh, and then you can do echo dollar x, and you'll get back 10. Hmm. Um, or you can do echo dollar curly brace, x curly brace, and you'll get back 10. So like, ah, doesn't seem to be a difference there. But what if you want to, say, print out uh, 10 years? Uh, if you do echo dollar x y it will print nothing because that variable is empty oh. but if you echo dollar curly brace x curly brace y then it'll actually print out 10 and then y uh, so it can be important especially when you are smooshing things together um, the other reasons you can use that syntax are the 
automatic substitution stuff. So in the curly braces, you can do like X colon stuff and you can do things like automatically strip the beginning and the ends off or, uh, you know, there are a bunch of different internal substitutions you can do instead of feeding that variable to something like grep or sed in order to do replaces. Some of the basic operations can be done automatically in line. And that works on the uh, born shell as well as uh, the POSIX shell, shell. Yes, regular POSIX shell. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, that's good in your uh, little uh, toolbox of shell scripting knowledge because um, it might come in handy. And if you want to know if that's actually a variable, make sure to include that in curlies. Otherwise, that might not be a, a real one like XY. I noticed a small bug in this website. At the bottom, all of the related posts are just called undefined. <laughs> Whoops. Maybe they just started off uh, or they don't relate any all. <laughs> I don't know, but it's Blogspot, so it might actually not be a bug that they created. Mm. Okay, I guess someone will look into that after listening to this episode. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, next up we have a, a little warning here. Beware of software engineering media sites. Yeah, so this is uh, part of a series of sporadic posts called Notes to a Young Software Engineer. Ah, yes, to a younger self of yourself. Yes. Uh, so it starts with a sample of the Hacker News front page and goes, Early in your career, a surprising number of poorly engineered software systems are due to mistakes with engineering media. Uh, in college and at boot camps, your primary exposure to engineering is through engineering media, like Hacker News, meetups, conferences, free code camps, Hacker Noon, and things like that. Technology that is widely discussed there, say microservices or a front-end framework or the blockchain or whatever, uh, then unnecessarily show up in your technology stack. The most common mistake you'll make uh, is to see that the, uh, these sources as a mirror of what's going on in your industry. Instead, it's more akin to a bazaar. Uh, picture a gargantuan bazaar in ancient times. Thousands of merchants... Uh, fill the stalls hawking goods from around the world. The bazaar owner finds the most unique merchant and gives them the most desirable stalls. Uh, this analogy for engineering media works on a few different levels. First, the merchants in the bazaar are there to convince you of one thing, which is to buy their product. In engineering media, the merchants are dev tool companies or training programs or open source projects or companies trying to hire developers. Given how dependent they are, on what engineers choose to use, um, these organizations are most motivated to create content and figure out how to get it distributed. Much like might happen in ancient times, merchants try to become your friend. In engineering, this has uh, similarities to content marketing, where helpful content is used to disguise marketing. Uh, moreover, many great engineers spend time building systems, not uh, writing or limiting their input into important debates. Uh, in the bazaar, the merchants set the tone. In engineering media, the vocal, those with a particularly personal agenda and a less nuanced viewpoint, dominate over the people who are actually busy working. Uh, tried and true technologies often have few advocates or rabid early adopters, while the newest have the motivated core and of supporters. So, you know, just because something's new and popular doesn't actually mean it's the right answer. Second, the bazaar attracts buyers of all stripes. In engineering media, like Hacker News, might attract a startup developer, a system administrator, a database administrator, a data scientist, a crypto a cryptography engineer, a front-end engineer, etc. By determining your technology choices based on popular posts, you can mistake the needs of one community for the needs of another. Uh, you know, just because front-end developers use JavaScript for everything doesn't mean JDBase administrators should. <laughs> Um, even within one community, like web development, uh, the needs of a startup may be vastly different than the needs of a consultant, uh, which is building, you know, many different websites rather than one big app. Basically, be careful not to fall in the trap of using something just because it's popular doesn't actually mean it's the right answer for what you're trying to build. Yeah. And thirdly, the owner that runs the bazaar with an eye of maximizing sales mercilessly favors the merchants that are successful. In social media and tech blogs, this means increased uh, engagement and upvotes and page views. In conferences and meetups, this means filling chairs 
by attracting the right speakers and featuring the content most demanded by the target audience and the sponsors. This sets an incentive for each merchant who wants to survive. So beyond just misinforming us, this drives uh, for this drive for engagement manipulates our desires to not be left behind, to stay relevant. And it seems we may have to use the technologies most hotly discussed. You know, in traditional media, death coverage is commonly used to maximize engagement and get clicks, and software engineering is covering the latest technology. Yep. And yeah, there's all the other nice and helpful tips uh, in that blog series. So check that out. And then we have the analysis uh, from how Verison and the BGP optimizer knocked large parts of the internet offline today, or at least the day of the, the blog post. Yes, that was uh, Monday morning, I think. Right, perfect timing <laughs> when the week started. Yeah, that was a fun Monday. Anyway, if you want to know a bit more about that, they have a post, you know, uh, it has a, a bit of a cloud flare slant on it, but the, the details are there. Yeah, in all uh, with graphics and pictures so that you can see what uh, went wrong and how they are going to prevent that in the future, which is the important learning of these types of events. Then we have a post here on Dragonfly BSD's list saying it's adding the um, MDS uh, mediation support for Intel side channel attacks. So the microarchitectural data sampling attack mitigation uh, is now added to the kernel. This is an attack against Intel CPUs made between 2011 and now. The attack is not currently known to work against any AMD CPUs. With uh, Intel microcode update, the mitigations can be enabled. Uh, so once you have the microcode, then you can use the software fixes. Uh, and it shows how you do that with the sysctl. If you don't have the Intel microcode update, only disabling hyperthreading gives you any protection. Older architectures might not get uh, microcode updates, so in that case, you might need to disable hyperthreading. Uh, currently, Dragonfly only supports the MD clear mode, and it will only be available uh, if you have the microcode update. Updating the microcode alone does not protect against the attack, since you actually need to use the new instructions that the microcode adds. Uh, this mitigation burns around 250 nanoseconds of additional latency on every kernel to user space transition, like system calls or interrupts. The additional latency uh, will not be present if the microcode has support, but it's uh, disabled in the kernel. So you should be able to safely update your microcode even if you uh, do not intend to use the mitigation. So um, the penalty only happens if you have the microcode and you enable the feature in Dragonfly. So you can update your microcode and not use the feature or be able to turn it on and off as you need, depending. Uh, they say it is unclear whether the microcode and mitigation completely protect the machine. The attack is supposedly a sibling uh, hyperthread attack, and that may be the only way to completely protect your machine is disable hyperthreading or by AMD. <laughs> and they note that uh, much of this template was taken from NetBSD. Okay. And as a little reminder for the people who haven't done it yet, you should register for EuroBSDCon 2019 in Lillehammer, Norway, uh, because it's awesome. It's EuroBSDCon, a different place every year. And so people should look at going there if they want to meet people from the BSDs, listen to the talks. And tutorials. Oh, yes. Um, there's a number of good tutorials this year, and there's one that's space limited. Uh, an introduction to hardware hacking with FreeBSD. Uh, this tutorial will provide an introduction to controlling hardware from FreeBSD. They'll cover using uh, GPIO to interface with real world uh, using tools in the FreeBSD based system. And then we'll expand on this basic IO by interfacing with sensors and output devices via standard buses. And then to complete the tutorial, we'll make a uh, simple status application to let us know uh, when someone has broke the FreeBSD build. Uh, in the tutorial, we'll perform Practical activities using an ARM single board computer running FreeBSD. Attendees will get a material pack, including that single board computer, uh, interesting input and output devices, some sensors, uh, and so on to make new hardware projects with FreeBSD. Uh, attendees should be comfortable on the command line and have a laptop with a spare USB port uh, and serial software like CU, Minicom, or Screen, uh, and then everything else will be provided as part of the tutorial. Excellent. One more reason to attend. There's only three spaces left for that tutorial. Oh. Uh, the rest of the tutorials, they can take as many people as sign up. But that one, 
you know, Tom only bought so many of the computers uh, for people. Yeah, so um, that's why it's limited. But the other ones, as, as mentioned, are open and the conference there as well, as long as you register and, and pay up front. And yeah, we hope to see you in Lillehammer in September. Yes, there are many great talks uh, and lots of good stuff. So we're hoping to see everybody there. Okay, it's time for the feedback and questions this week. Uh, always send us these questions, otherwise this section will be very empty. Uh, these could be comments, show notes, ideas. We got a lot of feedback, positive feedback, I have to say, uh, about the audio-only format. People like the uh, better quality of the audio that they get. And some people also remarked that they never actually uh, watch the videos, just listen to the audio, so that yes. was fine. And so, yeah, keep the feedback coming. I saw one of those as well. Somebody's like, until you mentioned that you were going audio only, I didn't know that there was video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, whoops. Uh. But uh, <laughs> if, if you do miss the video, if you go to bsdnow.tv slash live, uh, you can watch the show live when we're recording. But I didn't finish it last week, like I promised, but I will uh, uh, finish it today. Um so that the video from today's live recording will be available until next time we record. So you'll always be able to watch the last episode on, of, on, on the website. Now, it's, the video's not quite the same as it was before. It's mostly just our talking faces because um, I, I got rid of the third computer in the production setup <laughs> that, that normally did the websites. But anyway, if you need the video for it to be useful to you, then uh, you can check out uh, bsdnow.tv slash live uh, and you can use our DVR feature to watch last week's episode. Yeah, and to get in touch with us, uh, go and send a message to feedback at bsdnow.tv. You can also send us a tweet on Twitter to the bsdnow.tv channel, but I guess uh, email is uh, reaching us uh, better. All right, the first question is coming from Dave this week and it's about CherryBSD. Dave writes, CherryBSD gets a notable note in this very awesome paper review blog. Uh, people may be interested in subscribing. Yeah, this is uh, the Acolia blog, which puts out the uh, morning paper, which is basically you get an email each morning with a conference paper or an interesting paper in general from uh, computer science, IT, and uh, related areas. So this is nice. And they cover CherryBSD in that specific one on the 28th of May. Uh, there's also a video from at t Archives, he writes, about the Unix. That's a link uh, provided in the show notes. Uh, introducing the Unix operating system uh, shared in 2012 uh, via Mastodon. And interesting hearing the things we take for granted be explained as innovations and to understand that the gap is behind that. Excellent. So thanks for that. It didn't make it uh, the show notes, but it's good to have at least it uh, mentioned here because... Um, people should be aware. Yes. Well, the, the AT&T video we've covered before uh, off YouTube a couple of years ago, but it is definitely worth watching. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that, Dave. And next up is Neb uh, with Hello from Norway. Ah, so this is uh, <laughs> this year it's EuroBSD con land. So uh, De Neb writes, Dear Beastie guys, I listen quite a bit to your podcast and find BSD very attractive. Being fascinated by Unix since I first picked up a Norwegian edition of Using Unix by David W. Solomon from 92. Oh, wow. Uh, I still use it with great joy, the book. <laughs> Unix as well, hopefully. Um, I've been using Linux for almost a decade, but have always felt attracted to Real, real Unix. And your show is not exactly dampening that. Oh, great to hear. Uh, although it goes over my abilities, sometimes I'm fascinated by the low level stuff you often bring up. Uh, if I were to learn programming, I would prefer, please start with C or Assembler in tandem. Uh, anyway, today I listened to the 299th and 300th episodes. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for uh, keeping up with us. And I was reminded of the programming news that you will drop video and go high quality audio. Uh, I live on 10 gigabytes per month with Huawei or Huawei uh, slash Android, uh, Huawei plus Android handset. And after they are spent, I get 64K per second. Oh, unlimited. Hooray for text browsing and CLI. Uh, <laughs> in reality, it's closer to 1030 kilobytes per second. Oh, that's that's slow. Okay, so my worry is that your pods will claim more of my allotted quota uh, of bits than today. Can you consider having a low bitrate feed? When we say higher quality, we're not 
changing the like the bitrate of the audio. They were just actually switching from the raw recording to someone has done an edit pass and cleaned up the audio a bit. Uh, so it's higher production value. We're not actually uh, going to make a larger MP3 file. Yeah, so that shouldn't take uh, going against your uh, bandwidth, your available. Uh -huh. So, or maybe you've found out by 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 now. Um, yes, you don't have to set up a server to deload, decompress, strip data away, or something. Uh, you just uh, listen to the one that we put out. Uh, otherwise, I finally installed a BSD in the form of Nomad on a stick. Okay. Uh, soon my laptops and Pies will be blessed with different variants too. Excellent. Yeah, try out uh, various BSDs. That's a good thing to start at the beginning to see how they all uh, behave and work. Uh, would love to write even more, but I'll save that to once I get to my gopher hole up and running in the Tildiverse. Thanks again uh, for the great show and good luck with the new program changes. Thank you. Oh, uh, I try to pronounce the name. Niels Ivind Björnerud? Björnerud? Bjornarut. Okay. Well, if you come to EuroBSDCon, you can teach us how to pronounce your name properly. Isn't that a deal? And uh, Lars, but not least, I would almost say, Lars is <laughs> the last in this one, um, about Ansible tutorial, that rings a bell, um, writes, Hi guys, as a listener since day one and have asked questions before, excellent, you're the one that uh, keeps this section alive. Uh, congratulations on the 300 episodes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm actually surprised that, I, I mean, I came in at the last minute, basically, that Chris and Alan started this nice thing. Actually, at this point, you've done more episodes than Chris has. Did I? Okay. But like two. <laughs> like we're, we're, we're just passing the, the point. Every week it's another basically. one. Yeah. Okay. So the gap is widening. Yeah. All right. But yeah, Chris and Alan started originally and uh, also the people behind uh, the microphones and behind the scenes. So they deserve also the thanks. Okay. So back to Lars' question. Uh, I'm a salt stack user at the moment, but I want to get into Ansible now as well. Benedict has a PDF of his tutorial in his FreeBSD home directory. Oh, is it still there? Oh, I should clean up a little bit. Okay. Wait. <laughs> He's saying no. He's saying you cleaned it up and he was wondering if he could get a copy. Ah, stuff. yeah. Okay. So um, I can make it magically reappear in that location uh, for people to grab. I also got feedback from someone in private email about my um, lecture slides because I did a talk at uh, FOSDEM last year. And they also disappeared because our department restructured the website by breaking all the other links from the old web pages. Um, so I sent them a, a zip file so they have the slides available. Um, but this one, yeah, I can magically make that uh, reappear again and with some updates even. So that's even better. Uh, yes, I, was say. Hmm? I think there's an updated version by now. Yeah, so I did that and... Um, uh, I didn't put in the latest stuff from Ansible. I made some local changes also, but yeah, it's good to get started definitely and have a comparison with SaltStack is, um, is definitely possible there. Uh, looking forward to the publishing of the EuroBSDCon 2019 schedule. It's out there now. And why don't you put out something about SaltStack? Would be interesting how to use that on the BSDs. Maybe that will be a thing, maybe a blog post or something else. Um, yeah, so thanks, Lars, for this. And again, uh, by the time you watch this, you can find the uh, slides and everyone else, of course, at that um, URL that you posted. Okay, thanks for your interest and thank you for watching this week's episode of BSD Now. Again, to feed back at bsdnow.tv, direct everything that you want to see in future episodes, show notes, questions, ideas, everything that is worth including. Yep. 